her. Wow, I did so great so far. <laughs> um, it's my uh, it's my great privilege to speak to you today. I hope that I can uh, say something that's worthy of the time that you're giving me. Um, one of the reasons that I come to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation on most Sundays is for the opportunity to consider or meditate on a question or an issue or a truth that's presented in the sermon. And of course I listen to the speaker, but I also kind of turn the idea over in my mind and my heart and I examine it from different perspectives. Um, what I want to talk about today isn't really the moon or space or astronauts as much as I love all those things. At heart, it's about the gift of perspective. Um, I'm not going to give too much in the way of historical preamble today, although I love that too, um, but just to set the scene for today. Uh, the 1960s were the height of the space race, competition between American and Soviet powers to see who could demonstrate technological dominance in space, thus raising the worldwide prestige of either democracy or communism. The Soviets shocked the world with the orbit of Sputnik, then canine astronauts, then the first man in orbit, as well as further multi-cosmonaut missions and unmanned missions to the moon. But as the powers race towards the next goal, the manned lunar mission, the United States began to pull ahead. The Apollo missions at the end of the 60s tested the great Saturn V rocket that would take the Apollo capsule and its passengers to the moon, as well as the little lunar excursion module that would actually land on the surface. Now, Apollo 8 was scheduled for December of 1968. And, um, yes, I, I, I know I wasn't there, but um, 1968 was certainly a difficult year for the United States, to say the least. The assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr., Robert Kennedy, riots over racial injustice, the quagmire of the Vietnam War, and the protests against it dominated the headlines. For NASA, there was the concern that the Soviets would beat the U.S. to the punch once again with a manned lunar flyby. Now, both nations had already successfully sent unmanned probes. Uh, even if a Soviet mission didn't actually land on the moon, it was felt that if they managed to get a crewed mission around the moon first to get that close, then that would be a public relations nightmare for the United States. So to make a long story short, NASA planned to send Apollo 8, not as it was originally planned, as a, another round of tests in Earth orbit, but as a lunar flyby without the lunar excursion module, wouldn't land on the surface, uh, partially to test Saturn V's ability to get the module in lunar orbit and safely home again with humans on board. Now in this case, the humans in question were Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Uh, that's the order they appear in, in that picture. All of the military test pilots recruited into the astronaut program. Now, Jim Lovell, in the middle there, uh, he later gained fame as one of the astronauts aboard the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, from which he and his crewmates fortunately did return alive. But Apollo 8 itself represented a huge number of firsts in space. And we know how being first is so very, very important for children and countries. <laughs> it was the first manned test of the Saturn V rocket which had only been tested twice before. It was the first time humans left orbit of the Earth. It was the farthest, of course, that any human had ever been away from the Earth. It would be the first time humans orbited any celestial body other than the Earth. And it was also the first time that humans would set eyes on the whole Earth through the windows of a spacecraft instead of orbiting above it and seeing only part of it. The image that's on the flag here, uh, the one called the Blue Marble, is uh, such a picture of the whole Earth. Um, not the first one taken by any means, but one of the, the best and the most famous. This actually was taken by Apollo 17, uh, the, which is the last of the Apollo missions, 1972, after the moonshot fever had kind of ebbed. Uh, ho hum, another trip to the moon. You see how our familiarity seems to blunt our perspective. For the Apollo 8 astronauts, though, this experience of seeing the whole Earth from space was all new. 
They made attempts to show images of the Earth from the capsule window as Apollo 8 um, left the Earth during their three-day journey to the Moon and broadcast them live to Earth, which they had the technology to do at that time. But those images were unspectacular, fraught with technical difficulties and poor image quality. Nobody back on Earth was really able to get the sense of what the astronauts were seeing and experiencing. As Robert Poole says in his book, Earthrise, which is a wonderful book, viewers were assured that the fuzzy blob of light they were seeing was indeed the Earth, and the transmission soon reverted to floating toothbrushes and the like. But the crew themselves did feel the impact. The entire human race was in the frame, except for the three behind the camera. Now, the really famous events associated with Apollo 8 occurred once the astronauts completed the maneuver putting them in orbit around the moon. They were in orbit for about a day, including December 24th, Christmas Eve. And it's well documented that the astronauts themselves had actually spent a lot of time before the mission discussing what they should say during the broadcast back to Earth on Christmas Eve from moon orbit. This is detailed in a book called Genesis, the story of Apollo 8. What on earth do you say, so far from earth? In the broadcast, uh, I know this is kind of funny, but this is the view out the window. Here's the curvature of the moon. And when you watch the video of it, which you can see on YouTube, you can see all this stuff on YouTube, you can kind of see the, the slow rotation as, the, as the, um, the capsule goes over the earth, but the picture isn't really that great. But as they seem to say, there wasn't much to see anyway. Um, gray, no color, like plaster of Paris or dirty beach sand, said Jim Lovell. Frank Borman said, a vast, lonely expanse of nothing. And then the men took turns reading a passage each from the book of Genesis, the account of creation, representing ancient, cherished beliefs that they thought would resonate with people of all creeds. It's hard to imagine them doing that now. Most people at the time seemed to think that that was a suitable choice. Uh, you can see the, um, the image, which we'll talk about later today, commemorated on a stamp. In the beginning, God created the earth. It's giving the beginning words of that speech that was given from orbit. Most people thought that was a good choice, except for Madeleine Marie O'Hare, but that's a story for a different day. Borman signed off. Good night, good luck, Merry Christmas. And God bless all of you, all of you, on the good earth. That gets me every time. <laughs> Seconds later, Apollo 8 passed to the dark side of the moon and went silent on the radio. Just for a little while. Just, just when you go behind the moon, you can't, <laughs> you can't talk on the radio. The most famous moment associated with Apollo 8, though, is a photograph. The astronauts had been given a list of photographic targets on the moon's surface, and they had trained extensively with the cameras on board. So for the first few orbits around the moon, the astronauts were focused on getting those pictures and on other business inside the Apollo module, as you can uh, anticipate. Now, I've read that on the list of possible photographic targets that had been planned before the mission was the view of Earth from lunar orbit. Uh, which they listed under general interest. Wouldn't provide any scientific benefit or anything like that. Just, you might want to take that picture if you have a minute. It was expected that this would be one of the views to photograph, but it's clear from the audio inside the spacecraft that the astronauts were taken by surprise. Frank Borman was the commander of the module. He has written and been interviewed about his feelings about being part of the Apollo program. And in fact, Wendy Westwood alerted me to the fact that he was interviewed on This American Life in August, sometime when I was camping, and for once, not listening to This American Life. Now, I didn't learn anything new, really, from that, but it was interesting to hear that his opinion had not changed. Um, he was very clear that his primary motivation was not a sense of wonder and awe at exploring the universe. It was the drive to beat the Russians to the moon. That's what we wanted. But nevertheless, it's his voice on the audio breathing, oh my God, look at that picture over there. Here's the earth coming up. Wow, that is pretty. And his crewmate, Bill Anders, says, hand me that roll of color quick, will you? Hurry, quick. Astronauts are usually super cool. <laughs> super cool, boringly cool on audio. Uh, but he was really, he wanted that color film right away. The Earth rising over the moon's surface, seen for the first time by humans, our home, away from home. 
Anders said, we've been trained to look at the moon. We hadn't been trained to look back at the earth. They were struck by the bright colors of the earth in contrast to the blackness of space and the monochromatic moon. It was, as Lovell said, a grand oasis in the vastness of space. Now you will notice that nobody said, get me a roll of color quick, when they were approaching the moon. <laughs> Some color. Now the quick version of the rest of the story is that the camera film was developed a few days after the return of Apollo 8, and it appeared in newspapers like the Washington Post, Houston Chronicle, on December 30th, 1968, where it made an instant impact worldwide, which explains why even people who weren't alive in 1968 are very familiar with it. Now, I could quote you any number of very moving responses to this image. Historical analyses that suggest that this image, along with the blue marble, helped fuel the modern environmentalist movement. There's a lot of literature on that. But for that, I actually recommend the book Earthrise by Robert Poole. It details all of that. It's a wonderful book. And so today, I want to slow down just for a minute and consider some facts and ideas that have broadened my view of this image and everything it implies and share those with you briefly. Now first, when Apollo 8 rounded the moon and came upon the view of the Earth, what they saw wasn't Earthrise as the image is later known. That's why I have refrained from showing it until now. Now you're wondering, where is, where is the picture? Show the picture. <laughs> this is what they saw. Oh, sorry, that's, those are pictures of the moon. <laughs> Obviously I missed the slide, okay. This is not what they saw. This is what they saw. Whoops. It's probably not what you're used to seeing. The command module had left Earth and was orbiting the moon along an equatorial plane, more or less, which meant that they were really seeing the Earth coming out from behind the moon. When the image was published, it was cropped so the Earth would seem a little bare, which you know, is fine, uh, cleaned up a little bit. This is raw camera roll footage from the NASA website and it was uh, rotated. That's probably the thing, picture you're not familiar with. And you may have even seen it tilted to make the moon really flat, the, Earth, the moon surface really flat and the Earth, the Earth above it. Now, when you think about it, when we stand on the surface of the Earth and we see the moon in its phases, we watch it wax and wane from side to side, left to right, if you like, not up and down. So this image of the Earth toplet should seem kind of odd to us, but it doesn't. To our eyes, the important thing is it makes more sense to see it rising the way we see the sun and the moon rise while we stand on Earth. Now, in any case, to be honest, there's no directions in space. That's what the gyroscopes are for. <laughs> um, so take that comment on perspective, aesthetic perspective, as you will. Second, this is something, there's only three, by the way, just in case you're looking at the time. Second, this is something that literally only occurred to me a couple of days ago, which is why, you know, it's important to wait until closer to the date when you're going to give a talk to write it down. It's not about procrastination, it's about thinking about things. Um, and I was marveling at the idea that we would wonder in awe at the rise of Earth over the moon's surface, when on the moon that would happen all the time, right? And then, of course, I realized... It doesn't happen all the time on the moon. The moon rotates in the same period of time that it takes to revolve around the Earth. It is rotating, but it's such a way that only one side of the moon ever faces the Earth. You guys know this, right? That there's a dark side of the moon that we never see. Apparently it's not as interesting as the light side of the moon either. All kinds of questions about why that is. Um, if you stood full in the center of the near-lighted side of the moon, you wouldn't see the Earth rise, ever. Near the edges of the lit side of the moon, which wobble slightly over time, you would see a very, very, very slow Earth rise or Earth set, depending on where you were standing. So from our own humble planet, that we don't even need a rocket to leave, <laughs> well, we do need a rocket to leave, we don't need a rocket to get here, uh, you, we, we regularly see the rising and the setting of other celestial bodies fast enough that we can watch it happen before our eyes. Not only the sun, but the moon too. And here, how lucky we are to live here, near Lake Erie, home to some of the loveliest sunsets anywhere. 
The first humans to see the earth rise above the moon and the unique nature of that image doesn't take anything away from the regular delight of a particularly beautiful full reddish moon rising in the east or a crisp fingernail moon against purple blue sunset. Now who among us does not nudge the other people in the car or the backyard and say, look at that moon, even though we've seen it countless times. I think that's your picture. <laughs> I believe that's September 2015, one of the blood moons that we've seen in the last little while. Third point. An astronaut of our modern age, Leland Melvin, is perhaps best known for two things. First of all, he has the best NASA portrait of any astronaut ever. <laughs> Second is his use of the term orbital shift. Now, an orbital shift in technical terms is a maneuver of a spacecraft in which it changes its orbital plane. So you can start a spacecraft in one orbital plane and then use some kind of thrust to get it orbiting on a different plane. And that's very useful to be able to do in space. The first spacecraft, like the Mercury capsules that took men like Alan Shepard and John Glenn into orbit, actually Alan Shepard didn't actually go into orbit, it was just up and down, um, they didn't have the means to do this. So some people actually said they shouldn't even be called spacecraft because they couldn't maneuver in orbit. They were ballistic tin cans, something the astronauts themselves were very aware of. The later spacecraft, like Gemini, had thrust systems to be able to, uh, to do orbital shifts. Leland Melvin uh, flew on the shuttle Atlantis a couple of times, and he spoke of a different orbital shift. The shift in perspective that happens Quote, when you get to space and you see the world for what it is, no borders, no politics, no division. You probably know this. Many astronauts have come home speaking of being permanently changed by the experience of seeing the Earth from space. Whether they saw it just from orbit, seeing only part of it at a time, or whether they saw it full, blue, beautiful in the, in the window of the capsule. No matter how soon commercial space travel becomes possible, I don't expect myself to ever see the Earth from anywhere higher than about 30,000 feet in an airplane, which is still pretty cool. And I expect the same is true for most of you. So it would be easy to feel a little jealous of astronauts, and I do feel a little jealous, who have the opportunity to experience the orbital shift. However, I think we all know there would be some, there will be some, who might travel around the moon in the future of commercial space tourism, people who are rich enough to do that, and because of who they are, remain utterly unmoved by it. Change nothing about who they are. But an earthbound shift, one that happens with our feet firmly planted on the ground, can be totally seismic. The moments when our minds are suddenly and swiftly expanded by an experience, an image, a book, a piece of music, the birth of a child. An orbit is just a regular path of travel. And we decide or we are forced to change our paths all of the time here in our lives on Earth. Good thing, too, or we just keep going in circles. So I would say that departing the Earth's gravity is not a guaranteed catalyst for an orbital shift of the mind, nor is it required for such a shift in the mind and the heart. I want to close with what I think is our greatest tool in unlocking perspective and give an example of that. Imagination. When the Earthrise picture, not this one, but this is my backdrop. When the Earthrise picture was published in the weeks following the Apollo 8 mission, it was sometimes featured along a poetic essay, which you may have heard part of, uh, or all of, by Archibald McLeish, which was called Riders on Earth, that included these words. For the first time in all of time, men have seen the earth not as continents or oceans from the little distance of a hundred miles or two or three, but seen it from the depth of space, seen it whole and round and beautiful and small. What came to their minds a hundred thousand miles and more into space, halfway to the moon as they put it? What came to their minds was the life on that little lonely floating planet that tiny raft 
in the enormous empty night. The medieval notion of the earth put man at the center of everything. The nuclear notion of the earth put him nowhere, beyond the range of reason even, lost in absurdity and war. This latest notion may have other consequences. Formed as it was in the minds of heroic voyagers who are also men, it may remake our image of mankind. No longer that preposterous figure at the center no longer that degraded and degrading victim off at the margins of reality and blind with blood, man may at last become himself. To see the earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful, in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as riders on the earth together, brothers on that bright loveliness in the eternal cold, brothers who know now they are truly brothers. Now, I mentioned this was about imagination. Writers on Earth was first published just after it was written, December 25th, 1968. McLeish had not yet seen the Earthrise image. It hadn't been published yet. Or the clear, now familiar images of the blue marble. And it kind of sounds like he didn't need to. May we not be ballistic tin cans. May we shift. May we shift clumsily or gracefully, quickly or slowly, but shift nonetheless. May we shift gratefully and with open hearts and minds. And may we at last become ourselves. Thank you. Amen.